I will be presenting some of the work that's been going on in my group for the last couple of years. And um, my focus is very much on the fundamentals of crystal growth. And I realize that there's a very strong, um, a, a strong group of people here working on device applications, which is fantastic. So I don't need to tell you why compound semiconductors are so fascinating and useful, because you already know that people use them for solar cells, thermal electrics, high power electronics, night vision, all kinds of different things um, that you know, make our various devices possible. Now, my interest is more on the materials side. So if you take a look at this, this uh, diagram here, I'm going to use my digital pointer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I'm sure you've seen uh, this graph many times. Here we have the band gap of different uh, compound semiconductors as a function of lattice constants. Now, in order to make these, these devices possible, what you do is you take these different materials and you sandwich them together. Okay, and that's how you do band gap engineering, and this is where all of these fantastic properties and devices come from. Easy, easy as pie, right, Spig? No problem. <laughs> but the problem is, the problem, the challenge is over here. The lattice constant of all these different materials is different, so when you sandwich them together, what you end up with are potential problems. Not necessarily, but potential problems. You can form misfit dislocations, but which are not good. But you can also form self-assembled quantum dots, which are good. You can get surface segregation, and you can get phase separation. All of these issues are the types of things that fascinate me as a material scientist. So really, Zbig and I had a wonderful time talking earlier today because he's on you know, the y-axis, and I'm on the x-axis, and so there, there's a lot of things to work on in between. So I'll be telling you about some of the work that I've been doing in the three five-type semiconductors, the third and fifth column from the periodic table. The materials that I work with are aluminum, gallium, and indium on the group three side, arsenic and antimony, which are fairly standard, and also fairly new material, bismuth, which is a really interesting and infuriating element to be dealing with, for sure. So here are the different things that I'm going to be talking about. And um, there's no clock. So, oh, there it is. <laughs> so hopefully, um, I don't know if I'll be able to get through all of it, but I will endeavor to do so. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the physics of crystal growth. Now, I presume that many of you are familiar with compound semiconductors more generally. Yes, yes. Fabulous, fabulous. How many of you, uh, are you also fairly proficient in, in growth? Thermodynamics of growth, yes? Some of you, fabulous, good, good. Not all of you, so we'll see how that goes. I'll be talking about one particular material system, indium arsenide and timonide, and we're gonna specifically be talking about incorporation kinetics. I'm gonna talk a little bit about surfactants and surface reconstructions. And then, depending on how it goes, I'll start talking about um, atomic scale uh, processes for this new compound, gallium antimonide bismuth. And we'll talk about some of the bad things that can happen when droplets form on the surface. And then I'll tell you some of the good things that can happen when droplets form on the surface with the last topic on, on droplet epitaxy. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, we'll talk about this. Now, I'm sure I don't have to really motivate why we're interested in compound semiconductors to this group, because you already know that the atmosphere, you know, that we can use these things for various communication types of applications. This is just a transmittance uh, graph of the, our atmosphere as a function of wavelength. And you can see that there are various windows where you can have different wavelengths of light penetrate through the atmosphere. You know, so we have visible to some degree, and then we have near IR, I don't remember what S stands for, short wave IR, I suppose, mid wavelength IR, and long wavelength IR are the different kinds, are, are the different regions of wavelengths that can go through the atmosphere, and you can use these things for surveillance, for instance. So here, um, we're just looking at different kind of detectors, different kinds of cameras based on these different um, 
types of devices. You can see the first one is the visual one. You can see three guys standing there, and they're wearing all different kinds of camouflage clothing. And then you can see the differences as you go to SWIR, MWIR, and LWIR, and you can see that there are different features that now become prominent. Things that are quite visible in the visual sense uh, are not visible in shortwave, but are in longwave and so forth. So the military in particular, but also other security types of um, outfits are interested in uh, looking at these types of cameras at different wavelength ranges so they can surveil the surroundings. It's interesting, I actually got this image off of a Russian um, militia website. It was crazy. It was kind of like, you know, a, they, they have their own militias, just like we do in Michigan, um, and they were talking about the different kinds of detectors. Crazy what you can find on the internet these days. Now, when we're trying to look at the very long wavelength infrared um, detector type of materials, you need to go down here where you have the very um, small band gaps, long wavelengths. So here you can kind of get a little bit of a sense. This is one, uh, 1.3 micron, and as you go down, the wavelength gets longer and longer, and we want to be somewhere in the range of 12, 13, 14 microns. Now, the canonical material that people use are cadmium, is, is mercury cadmium telluride. So that's this alloy here. You'll notice that mercury tellurium is a metal but cadmium telluride is not, it's a semiconductor. So if you mix these two things together, uh, you can get fairly long, very um, narrow band gap material. Now this material is the, the industry standard, but the rest of optoelectronics is doing work over in the other three fives, and this is a two six. So we'd like to be able to use a material that is a three five that we can integrate with known technologies. So the closest thing that we have is indium arsenide and timonide. And you'll notice that you know, it almost goes down uh, fairly low, but it doesn't really go low enough. And furthermore, this material has a large miscibility gap, which I'll get to in a minute. Recently, however, people began looking at this material again and started really paying attention to the quality of the material, not only um, whether or not there was phase separation going on, but also the lattice mismatch. And when they were particularly careful, what they found was that the band gap energy actually bows down lower than previously thought. So before, people thought that the band gap energy was going to not really dip down be below 0.2 or so EV, but now they're finding that they can actually get down much lower. And in fact, right in this area here is precisely the wavelength that people are most interested in for these long wavelength IR detectors. And so now we have a new hope, looking at this material. I've alluded to the fact that this material is a little problematic because it does have a miscibility gap. So when I say miscibility gap, how many of you guys know what I'm talking about? Anyone? Anyone? It's big. Good. But the rest of you uh, haven't heard this particular term. Here I have a phase diagram of um, indium arsenide. This is not indium sulfide, this is indium antimonide, the B got cut off. And this line over here, basically, what it indicates is that if you try growing a material, indium arsenide and timonide, with these compositions down at these temperatures, that it'll separate into two different compositions, like oil and water. Rather than getting the two uh, compounds to dissolve in one another, they will separate and basically, that's not what you want for your device because you want a single band gap, right? You don't want a distribution of band gaps within your device. And you can see what happens when you grow these materials over here. The two different peaks in the X-ray diffraction show that in fact there are these two very distinct kinds of compositions that are growing in there. You definitely want to avoid that. Now more recently, as I said, we can prevent this by growing on lattice match substrates. So rather than just depositing and you know, hoping for the best, throwing everything down on the substrate, what you do is you grow on a graded buffer layer that is very carefully engineered so that the, the lattice parameter at the starting interface is the lattice parameter that you want for that composition. And in doing that, you can prevent the phase separation and actually get the material uh, high enough quality so you can reach the band gaps that you want. 
Now, that's all fine and good. I want to understand how to get as much antimony into the system as possible. Um, because if we want to get 60%, we want to be able to, to, to understand each one of the processes during growth. So I'm just going to talk about the different competing processes here. So um, if you take a look, each process uh, is just given by an Arrhenius dependence here. And so this is just the surface site density. This is a frequency. This here is just the flux of incoming metal atoms. And it is just an exponential with some kind of activation energy here. That's the rate of each process. White atoms are indium, blue atoms are arsenic, and yellow atoms are antimony. So let's think about all of the different processes that contribute to our net flux. So obviously the first one is deposition. The second one is desorption. Right? There is going to be some probability that any atom that comes down on the surface can also desorb away from that surface. And that depends on a number of things. This um, theta is just the surface coverage. Now, the next thing that is known to happen for mixed anion alloys is that arsenic is a bully. And arsenic says, hey, antimony, get out of here. <laughs> no, get out. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Get up so I can sit down. That's what, that's what arsenic does, right? And so it kicks that out. That's called a, a removal term. And then there's one more process that we have to take into consideration, and this is called segregation. So if you have an antimony down here and it becomes covered with arsenic, these two have some probability of switching. Now, all of these processes come together to form some net, okay, some net rate, some net flux coming down on the surface. Now, you can also write down there it is. You can write down another net flux for the arsenic, the net arsenic flux, and the ratio of these two. So the flux of antimony divided by the sum of the fluxes is just going to be the composition, right? All we need to know now is what are the activation energies. No problem. So the desorption energies are known. The segregation energies are known. We don't know the removal energies. So what we need to do is some experiments, and we can try to fit that. And so that's what we've done. And so here's just the antimony fraction as a function of substrate temperature. You draw a line through that, and you can then fit the data. The points are the, the experimental data, and the line is, is the fit of the model. Okay, So we only really have one fitting parameter, because everything else we can get from the literature assuming that the literature is correct, which may or may not be the case, but still. So here we have it, as we increase the substrate temperature, we decrease the amount of antimony. Yay, we know something. But the thing is, is we want high quality material, and how do you get the highest quality material? You grow at high temperature. But if you grow at high temperature, you reduce the amount of antimony that you can put in there. So we need to think of a way to compel that antimony to go in. So we need to manipulate the processes. As I said, lowering the temperature could, could uh, kill the desorption term, right? But lowering the temperature will also hurt our quality. So what can we do instead? Let's cut off that removal term. Let's say that bully, arsenic, can't bully antimony anymore. One way to the, that we might be able to do that OK, so here's that term right there. One thing that we might try to do is introduce a surfactant, an intermediary. In this case, we're going to say bismuth. OK, so here comes bismuth. Would you like to be bismuth for me? Or you can be, how about you be arsenic, and then I'll be bismuth. Go ahead, go ahead. Yell at him. Wow. Okay. Go ahead. I'm going to stand here. Go ahead. Bully him. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm bismuth. I'll go with you instead. OK? So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to put bismuth there on the surface. Oh, dear. Did it break? Hilarious. 
Okay, no, it's good. So the idea is, is that we want to put in this intermediary, we want to put bismuth on the surface so that bismuth instead um, will be removed. Or maybe it'll just be a blockade and that removal term won't happen at all. And so what we want to do is actually prevent the removal from happening, right? Brilliant idea. That should work, right? Yeah? Not so much. So this line here is what happens when you actually add that bismuth um, surfactant. It actually makes things worse, right? So rather than being that intermediary telling that bully arsenic to go away, it's actually teaming up with the arsenic and causing more of that removal, more arsenic being incorporated into the film as opposed to antimony. And this is precisely what we don't want to have happen. So now we have to actually rethink things. Say, OK, you know, the simple thing is just to try to incorporate that, that um, surfactant. But maybe we need to think about the surface in a more sophisticated way. Now, um, how many of you are familiar with the concept of a surface reconstruction? OK, a few of you. So remember now that um, compound semiconductors have a zinc blend uh, crystal structure. What that means is that if you have an atom, and it's, say the atom is the intersection of my palms, it has two um, bonds going in one direction and two bonds going in, into the other direction. This is tetrahedral coordination. Yeah? And so now if you cut a surface, what you'll have is you'll have all these directional bonds pointing out into the surface. And as you know, covalent bonds are very directional. Yeah? But they also want to be taken up. They want to bond. So what will happen is instead of having all these dangling bonds hanging out in the surface that you see in the top part of the diagram, the atoms will actually move towards each other so that they can dimerize and actually take up some of those dangling bonds. Okay? And so that's what, what I have listed here on the bottom. This is a surface reconstruction. So the atoms on the surface will actually move and bond with one another to lower the surface energy. Now, the precise details of that surface reconstruction depend a great deal on precisely what's going on. What are the chemical potentials of the different atoms involved, temperatures, overpressures, all of those things. And so, you know, rather than having this really very simple picture of just atoms, you know, uncoordinated atoms just sitting there with bismuth as an intermediary, we need to be more sophisticated and look at the surface reconstructions in more detail. So um, those of you who uh, work in MBE, typically the way you see a reconstruction is you look at a diffraction pattern, right? And so what you see is that this separation here, that's the diffraction pattern from the bulk. And then anything that happens in between, these represent the um, increased uh, or the the change in the periodicity due to that different structure on the surface. This is what it looks like in reciprocal space, and this is what it looks like in real space. Okay, so this here is an STM image, and what you can see are these rows of atoms. These guys, these little lima beans here, those are the dimers that I was just discussing. Okay? And then you also see that there's another kind of reconstruction on the surface as well. Okay, and I'll discuss that in just a second. So here what we see is a combination of different kinds of surface reconstructions in real space. Okay? Now, can we predict which reconstructions are going to be uh, happening when? Well, in the past what people did, so this is 1990, ancient times, um, <laughs> um, what people did is they would actually map out what reconstructions were possible empirically. Okay, so these, this is just an experimentally drawn phase map. We'd like to do better, and we'd like to calculate what this phase map might be. And so it's a difficult process. The first thing that you do is you just look at the reconstructions that are possible, and you're like, okay, here are all of them that are possible. I'm just going to enumerate every single one. And then you do density functional theory, ab initio uh, calculations to figure out which one of these are going to be the lowest energy ones. And so here are all of the different, this actually is just a partial graph, but it's looking at the energies of the reconstructions that were calculated. And we know that these ones at the minimum here are the ones that are lowest in energy. 
Okay, so now we take these and we can see that we've got 20 plus 20 plus 23 plus 23 plus another 124 different reconstructions. Now, that might sound like an awful lot of reconstructions to deal with, but when we started, there were 10 to the 12th reconstructions for us to go through. So this process actually weeds out a lot of the reconstructions so we don't have to calculate every single one. And then what we do on top of that is, remember, these are just the structures. But we don't only have the structure, so think back to your um, x-ray diffraction or your diffraction courses. You have the unit cell, right, which is just the reconstruction itself. But then you have the structure factor, which are the details of which atoms are sitting where within the unit cell, right? We have to consider both those things as well. And so the way that we do that is we do something called a cluster expansion, where we look at interactions between individual atoms, pairs, and triplets, and we look to see what are the interaction energies of those. So rather than having to calculate all of the, the, uh, all of the different unit cells, now all we have to do is calculate just the pair, the single pair and triplet interactions and build the unit cells from there. Once we do all that, we can actually come up with a phase diagram. Now mind you, this phase these phase diagrams that I'm showing you are for gallium arsenide and gallium antimony. The material I was, I was talking about before is indium arsenide antimony. We're still in the process of calculating that particular di diagram. It does take a supercomputer several months to get through all of those calculations. So soon, soon, we should have them done. But I'm going to go ahead on the assumption that gallium arsenide and gallium antimonide are similar enough chemically that we should be able to make some kind of general predictions as to what's going on. Now the first thing to, to notice is that we do have similar but different kinds of reconstructions that appear on the surface. The most important thing to keep in mind is that for this phase diagram, in this phase space, the surface is only terminated in arsenic. Up there, the surface is only terminated in bismuth. In between, the surface is terminated in both arsenic and bismuth in different kinds of configurations. If you look at the gallium antimonide case, here we have only antimony, up there we have only bismuth, and we have a much smaller regime in phase space where we can even have arsenic, or antimony and bismuth on the surface together. So really, antimony doesn't like bismuth at all. It will not bond with bismuth, but it will bond with arsenic. So this is what I'm talking about. Here are different configurations of the surface reconstructions. Uh, yellow is gallium, blue is arsenic, green is bismuth, and over there red is antimony. And what you can see here this is the most mixed you'll see. This is the only, these are the only structures where, you'll, where you will see antimony and bismuth on the same surface. Notice that the antimony doesn't bond at all with the bismuth. The bismuth only bonds to itself on the surface, will not bond to antimony. But it will bond to arsenic in lots of different configurations. There are about 32 different configurations that are possible. I'm showing you three of them. So the bottom line here is, is the reason why bismuth didn't work as a surfactant is because it didn't behave the way we were expecting. We were expecting it to be a physical barrier between the antimony and the arsenic. But what happened instead is that bismuth actually reacted with the arsenic and displaced bismuth. So that's why it made it worse. The arsenic was already displacing bismuth and then the bismuth itself was reacting with the arsenic on the surface at the expense of antimony. So that's the first thing um, that I wanted to talk about, about the incorporation in alloys. And just the bottom line is, is that when you're trying to grow these alloys, especially the mixed anion alloys, and I know that you guys are starting to look into the antimonides, it does become quite complicated because not only do you have to think about the kinetics of the arriving fluxes, but you also have to think about the different reactions between the different species and also how those species change the surface 
uh, itself, which is going to impact the um, incorporation of the different anions. So next, let's talk about, okay. That, next, let's talk about this new alloy, gallium and timonide bismuth. And remember, I told you that antimony and bismuth don't like each other, right? I told you that. The bismuthides are very interesting. So again, looking at gallium bismuth over here, it's a semi-metal. But if you mix it with either antimony or arsenic, this one is showing what happens when you mix it with arsenic, it decreases the band gap by a lot. So this offers an interesting opportunity because a little bit of bismuth added to the lattice can change the, la the, the band gap by, by a much larger um, amount that you might expect which is good because you can actually make, have more leeway with the uh, band gap engineering without having to change the lattice constant too much. So people are very much interested in this material. Those of you in the audience who are also interested in quantum computing, uh, bismuth also has a, a very large spin orbit splitting. So it becomes interesting for those applications as well. The trouble is, it's not very easy to grow. We're not able to incorporate a lot of bismuth into the material. This is for gallium arsenide. You can see that the most you can get into the material, um, so in this particular graph, is 6%. Um, some people have been able to get it up to 20%, but as far as I know, it's only that one lab. Have you heard of any other lab but TG's being able to get up to 20%? I know at Wisconsin they've been trying and they can't get above 10. So getting the bismuth into the alloy is very, very problematic. And what it likes to do is it likes to ball up on the surface. So this is some of our work. We're trying to grow, in this case, gallium antimonide bismuthide. And here's the result of one such attempt. This is an SEM of the surface. And you see we have really large droplets on the surface. And the droplets are combinations of bismuth and gallium. So bismuth and gallium also phase separate. So you see that it's not a mixed layer. It's a phase separated droplet, actually. This is not so good for making devices. We wanted to understand this as well. And so um, the one way that we were doing that is you saw with the ab initio calculations. And you saw that you know, perhaps it's not so surprising um, Arsenic and antimony uh, doesn't like bonding with bismuth, and so that's one reason why we don't have incorporation. But we also wanted to look at the kinetics of it to see if maybe we can get some regimes where we can get incorporation and high um, and nice clean layers. So we decided to put together a kinetic Monte Carlo simulation. This is in um, collaboration with one of my colleagues in. Um, in the math department, I'd be happy to tell you more about the simulation. But the, the important thing to realize here is that this simulation is able to actually handle anions and cations separately, uh, which is a fairly new feature. And that also allows us to be able to um, take droplets into account. So if we have cation or anion-rich regions, uh, it can, the, the simulation can actually handle that. So here we have. Um, a simulation for a bismuth containing 3,5. There's no sound. I hope you can see this. So basically what you see is we're depositing material and you can see there are little flex. Those are the bismuth. We're trying to incorporate 10%. And you see that it's, it's incorporating. Things are nicely behaved. It's growing up. But then you start to see these little subcritical nuclei that form and then dissolve and then form again. Once the critical size has been exceeded, you'll see that that droplet, you saw it kind of bouncing around, it's quite mobile on the surface. Um, but after some time, it does form on the surface and stay. Okay, so that is what we were watching there, is the nucleation of a bismuth droplet. Okay, so we can capture, um, we can capture the phenomenon. And in fact, if you try to compare the data, what we saw you know, so this is the experimental data again. This is our simulated data. We can see, we can replicate the fact that as you increase the growth rate, you can see that the slope of this incorporation curve goes down. And that's true in our data as well. So here are three different growth rates of the gallium. And you can see that the incorporation, the slope of the incorporation curve goes down. 
But here's where it gets interesting. Um, that isn't shown up here. Once you start to nucleate droplets, which are indicated by the, these closed circ the closed um, dots here, what you see is that the incorporation stops or even starts to decrease. So the question is, is what's going on there? Why is it that as soon as we start forming droplets on the surface, does the incorporation stop? Well, if you look at the simulation, it's totally clear what happens. On the top, we have film that, ha that hasn't uh, formed a droplet. And on the bottom, we have one that has. And you can see that away from the droplet, we have bismuth incorporation. But in the vicinity, not so much, right? And then if you take a look at the bismuth concentration as a function of height, not counting the bismuth droplet, you can see that here in the top one, the composition is pretty constant. But for the other one, the composition is initially high at the substrate film interface, but then drops off as you increase in uh, the thickness. And what's happening here is as soon as you have the droplet forming on the surface, what it does is it sucks up all of the bismuth. The bismuth now doesn't want to incorporate in the surface. It takes too much energy to do that. It takes much less energy for it to move over and just go to the droplet. When you see the simulation, I mean, all of you are sitting there going, obviously that's what's happening. But before, we didn't realize what was going on. And a lot of experimental data, you know, you couldn't really tell when the droplets nucleated. So we couldn't make that correlation between this event of droplet nucleation and when the, um, the composition actually dropped down. So to see this was kind of mysterious for some time. So, sorry, so, so what was the diffusion left for the, uh, for, for the bismuth on the surface? This is the, the surface diffusion which brings it to the droplet, or it's actually bulk diffusion when the droplet forms? There's no bulk diffusion in this particular simulation. We turned all of that off. We don't allow it. Okay. Um, all of these things, it's a surface process. And everything is just done by bond, bond counting. And so we have, you know, like bismuth bismuth interaction, bismuth arsenic interactions, uh, bismuth gallium interactions, and so forth. And so by looking at any particular spot, you know, the way Monte Carlo works is you pick a location and you're like, okay, um, let's count, you know, what are we going to say happens? Okay, we're going to say a diffusion happens here. Okay, count up all of the different bond energies around you and then calculate the probability of that happening, throw the dice, and then maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't. So everything's a surface process. Okay. Um, however, we do allow for diffusion through the liquid. So if we have, um, and so we don't allow for bulk diffusion in solids, but we do allow for bulk diffusion in liquids, okay, because those bond strengths are much lower. So now that we've demonstrated you know, that we can actually replicate experiments and so forth, what we can do is actually create phase diagrams, kinetic phase diagrams, to figure out what are the conditions that we need to be growing under. And so what we're showing is bismuth flux on the bottom, and then the ratio of arsenic to gallium flux. The open points uh, up in the upper left-hand corner, no drops. That's where we want to be growing. If you increase the flux, the bismuth flux too much, you start to get bismuth droplets, not surprisingly. If you drop the, the gallium flux, if you drop the arsenic flux, of course you're going to get uh, gallium droplets, but you can also get both if these two fluxes are, if this flux is too high and the arsenic flux is too low. Okay, so now we have a regime, we know exactly where we need to go in order to prevent those droplets from forming. And uh, we're also putting together a map that shows us where the highest incorporation should be also um, in here. So I hope what I've shown you here is what can happen as a result of the fact that, that antimony and bismuth don't like each other. These bismuth droplets can, can form, and that has some pretty serious consequences on the bulk film itself. It changes the composition of the bulk film. But we can use simulation to figure some of these things out and actually guide our experiments um, so that we can avoid these things without having to go through just ridiculous amounts of parameter space. So now, in the last few minutes, I'm going to talk to you a little bit 
about how we can use droplets in a good way, to do good for us, to work for us. Now, um, here I'm just showing a really basic uh, review of the different growth modes that are possible for thin films. Have you seen this before? Yeah? So, you know, if, if, you, if the, if the um, surface energy of the film and the substrate are, are the same, similar, or maybe the, uh, the film is lower, then you get layer by layer growth. If it's reversed, you're going to get three-dimensional growth. And it's possible also to get stransky krasnov growth, where initially you have layer by layer growth followed by three-dimensional islanding. And the stransky krasnov growth mode is the most common way that people have been making um, uh, self-assembled quantum dots in these epitaxial systems. And so the thought has always been that it is necessary to have lattice mismatch strain in order to get quantum dots, which is annoying because you have lattice mismatch strain. If you have too much of that, you're going to get dislocations. You're going to get all kinds of crazy stuff happening, and you don't want that. So is there another way that we can actually grow these films without lattice mismatch strain? And the answer is yes. We can use something called droplet epitaxy. In this case, what we do is first we deposit gallium, say, in the absence of any arsenic, you get gallium droplets. Turn off your gallium flux, expose your gallium droplets to arsenic, and they crystallize in place. No lattice mismatch required. This is entirely a, a, a surface energy driven phenomenon. And it's really, it really works, and you can get all kinds of different nanostructures uh, using this method. So this is experimental work that we published several years ago. Here we have increasing substrate temperature. You'll notice the substrate temperatures are very low. And we have increasing arsenic overpressure. And you can see that we have a whole zoo of different kinds of nanostructures. You can get compact islands. You can get tooth, teeth if you like, these look like molars, you can get rings, you can get discs, or you can get holes. And for a while, people were really confused. Why are we getting these kinds of structures? It doesn't really make any sense. There were lots of different theories coming out there in the literature. We decided to apply our simulation to it to try to see if we can actually see what's happening with the simulation. So here, let me just explain. We're just doing gallium arsenide on gallium arsenide. Um, so red is gallium in the substrate. Green is arsenic in the substrate. Purple is gallium that's been deposited. And then blue is arsenic that's been deposited. So let's take a look. So the first thing that we do is we deposit gallium. And the first thing that you'll notice is that the gallium actually eats away at the gallium arsenide, right? This is entirely expected. If you take a look at the phase diagram, you'll see that arsenic is soluble in gallium. And so it should eat into the substrate. So we were thrilled to see this. Okay, so, so far so good. Okay, so deposit the gallium, we get gallium droplets. The droplets eat into the substrate. Now we're gonna expose it to arsenic. And you see some really interesting things happening. Can you see that we've got the gallium is, is crystallizing out here. You can see that the, galli the gallium arsenide is also crystallizing from the bottom. We're consuming all of the gallium until we have gallium arsenide quantum dot. Yeah? It's beautiful, right? So now take a look at the, um, the conditions there. We're going to change the conditions. Um, we're going to raise the temperature and lower the arsenic over pressure. And we're going to get something a little different. So again, higher temperatures, so the gallium is actually going to sink into the substrate a little bit more. You'll notice that there's a lot of this movement out of the droplet. What's happening is that the gallium is actually diffusing away from the droplet. You can also see that we have crystallization at the liquid-solid interface, but it's not nearly as fast as the out diffusion. We're consuming the gallium. The gallium continues to be consumed. You can see that we have this growth of a feature outside of the droplet. And then once this thing, can you see the, the gallium just running out, running up that staircase? And then once it's done, you have something that looks like this. This is in two dimensions. Imagine you take this in three dimensions, spin it around, it's a ring. Okay, so, so far we've identified two different things that are going on. We've identified that there's 
crystallization at the liquid solid interface, and there's diffusion of the gallium out. There's one more process that can happen. This is at low temperature and high arsenic. So low temperature, not a lot of etching into the substrate, very high arsenic over pressure. And now what's going to happen once we expose it to arsenic is that, there, they, there it goes, we have nucleation of gallium arsenide at the liquid vapor interface. And what happens in this case is those nuclei grow until it blocks off all of the gallium. And what we're left with is our gallium centers encased in gallium arsenide, but you'll notice that the gallium arsenide is defective. It has defects and there's not a potassium. So what we can do is we've established that we've got all these different mechanisms, which we couldn't tell we had before, before we had the simulation. We have out diffusion of gallium, we have crystallization here, and then we also have uh, nucleation up there. You can also get deposition up out there, but we can ignore that for now. And so we can again create a phase map, and this phase map exactly matches the, um, the experimental phase diagram. So we can be fairly certain that in fact we got the physics right, that we have most of these things correct. But there's another structure that appears here that I think is really cool. And this one, for those of you who are material scientists, here we have a Mullins and Sakurka instability which is so cool. So here we are, we start out with gallium. Now look at this interface. You see how this interface is kind of like moving around like this? It's really unstable. The kinetics of the situation are really unstable. So once the, kinet once the arsenic starts to crystallize, look at that interface. It's just moving around, moving around like crazy. After a while, it's so unstable that it'll come up over itself. And we have the gallium droplet again but this time we have a purely epitaxial shell, okay? And this is very exciting because it doesn't have defects. We can grow over the top of it and embed metal into these semiconductors, which is great news for plasmonics, say. So this is really kind of cool. And we didn't know that this was going to happen, so we went back and did some experiments, grew the quantum dots in this regime, and lo, we found Gallium, so here's a quantum dot, here's gallium everywhere. But when we look for the arsenic signal, there's no arsenic in the center. And we did it consistently. We had gallium everywhere, but no arsenic in the center under the conditions where the Mullins and Sakurk instability is supposed to occur. So here is another, uh, another way that we can use these simulations in order to make predictions. Okay, and so here we are. We've been able to use the simulations to actually develop understand what the competing mechanisms are for droplet epitaxy. And then we can also, um, I didn't talk about the lattice mismatched uh, droplet epitaxy. I can do that if, if you're interested in that as well. So I'm out of time. I told you a little bit about incorporation and I described how it's more complicated that, than you might first expect. And you have to take some pretty sophisticated things into account. I've talked to you about the formation of droplets and the negative consequences that they can have in the film, but I also told you about how we can use those droplets to create structures that we couldn't form any other way. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and thank you for allowing me to put you on the spot. Thank you very much. Um, this one? No. You want the phase diagram of the surface reconstructions, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Very smart. Good question. Um, so it is true that these phase diagrams that I'm showing, these here are zero Kelvin, right? So these are done DFT, so these are done at zero Kelvin. And so one of the other things that we're doing is we're currently in the process of doing Monte Carlo and these to see how temperature stable they are. We've done them in the gallium arsenide system and uh, we, we actually found that the four by three surface reconstruction 
because it has so, much config so many different configurations that are possible, it's very stable at high temperatures. So we expect the four by three is in fact the stable structure. Whether or not it's the alpha or the beta or the H naught, you know, the positions of these different boundaries may shift, but I'm pretty confident that this is, that this is going to be robust at high temperatures. What is high temperature in alpha? Growth temperatures. Growth temperature, higher than that, right. So there's an interesting, um, afterwards, come down and I will show you some interesting data on gallium arsenide specifically and how we've done some simulations where at the zero K, uh, we don't get the experimental result, mm -hmm. but when we actually test those reconstructions at finite temperature, we actually do recover the experimental result. So, but your point about the temperature, this being a zero K is very well taken. Um, and it is something that you have to look at these phase diagrams with skepticism, so thank you. So in your Monte Carlo simulations, have you, uh, have you uh, considered uh, things like interstitials? I mean, there's that, with the drop that it exit, there has been persisting a problem of you know, optical quality, which basically defects, which are nevertheless incorporated. And uh, you know, one of the risks, of course, is that you will get a, you know, a not truly stuck emitted material and some of the gallium can be. Well, and we predict that, yeah? I mean, so, in fact, we do predict that you won't get stoichiometric material depending on what regime you're in. Oops. So if you're in this regime, you know, if you look at these droplets, right, in AFM, yeah. you can't tell that they've got gooey centers. You don't know, right? Um, now, it could be that you don't have that much um, gallium in the center, maybe you've got a lot less gallium, but certainly in this case, if you have too much arsenic, um, the way that this crystallizes it does introduce a lot of defects, right? And so that can persist. So, so you, in, the, in all the configurations which you consider for the Monte Carlo, positioning of atoms, interstitials are also... We don't take interstitials into account. Um, this is all, we do assume that, that all the atoms are on lattice. Now, the, the lattice, we do allow for overhangs, you know, so voids can happen, um, so um, vacancies can happen, but we don't have a way to account for interstitials yet. But I'm not sure that inter interstitials are the issue. I think the issue is really anti-site defects. Um, you know, that during the crystallization process, what can happen is you get one region that nucleates and it's out of phase with another region, and then if you don't take care, that gets incorporated into the crystal. Um, so I actually, you know, if, if you know that you're in this area, you know, you can either, you can do a number of things to combat that. Um, you can either anneal this before, deposit, before capping, and that should take care of the anti-site defects. Um, or you can try growing it, you know, cutting down on the arsenic overpressure and come down into this regime here so that you don't, so you don't engage this mechanism at all, right? Now, if you're here, you know, you've got something else going on. So you don't have defects, but you do have the gallium in the center. But that should, in principle, enhance photoluminescence, right? Because it's going to be a plasmonic effect, in principle. So, yeah, so this, I mean, you could use this phase map um, to guide what experiments you should be doing. You know, if you were to take, you know, if you had quantum dots that you grew this way and you found that you were not getting the performance you were expecting, you know, this can tell you where to go uh, with your experiments. For Monte Carlo simulation, they're notorious for taking a very large number of cycles to achieve conversions. Uh, how do you measure your conversions? How do you, how do you determine Um, that's a great question. Um, these particular um, Monte Carlo simulations, um, they employ a, um, a particular algorithm that, um, it actually speeds up the convergence uh, by an order of magnitude. And 
Really, you should look at the paper to get the details on the convergence. I'm sorry, I can't answer it in more detail right now. Um, but we did, we did employ a number of techniques in order to speed up the process. You know, we use uh, lookup tables, you know, so that we don't have to keep recalculating the same configurations over and over again. So that's a simple one. And then there, there's also another um, algorithm that allows us to speed up the process, and it's, it's eluding me right now what it's called. But it's, it's in the paper. All the details are in the paper. Is there any fundamental chemical bonding reason why bismuth um, uh, prefers arsenic to antimony? I mean, I know it you know, has a lower ionization potential, so uh, it's more likely to, to form stronger bonds with something that's more electropositive, and that would be the That would be arsenic. I mean, that seems like the most rational explanation. Um, but I don't actually have a, a better answer than that. I mean, you hit on precisely what I was thinking. Yeah. Um, and what we ought to do to test that, I mean, we could in principle look at other alloys with phosphorus or nitrogen to see if we have similar kind of effects, you know, going to the smaller, more electronegative elements. But yeah, that's, that's a very appropriate thing to think, I think. So has bismuth been incorporated into any um, 3-5 semiconductor materials that are useful yet? Oh, there's the $30,000 question, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's also a great question. I know that NREL has been uh, working with these materials for quite some time to try to get them to, incorpor to use them in solar cells. But there's a group in the UK that recently was able to make a gallium arsenide bismuthide laser. Um, so people are working on it, and device quality material is, is certainly on the way. So we, a laser has been made. So maybe, maybe just a, a quick question. Do you have any idea what is the, the nucleation energy for that, that uh, bismuth uh, nucleation to separate phases and then, then later the growth uh, of these droplets? Do right. Do you know anything sort of energetically, sort of thermodynamic uh, you know, concept of this, I, I assume, would, would uh, involve the nucleation energy of the bismuth that's probably more favorable than, than incorporation into the lattice? Right, Do you so know anything about these thermodynamic parameters? So, um, well, thermodynamic parameters, you know, those, those energies are, are thermodynamic, but then the rates, of how quickly Correct. these things happen are Correct. kinetic. This looks kinetic, right. I mean, That's this right. This from the kinetic concept. But right. I'm asking about the thermodynamic side of it. Right. So the way that we've been doing it is we can establish, um, there's no, is there a pen? Ah, there is. You know, so there, there's all these different interaction energies that we can take into consideration, right? So there's the... The gallium arsenide bonding energy, there's the gallium, gallium bonding energy, so this one's known. Um, this one's fairly well known. Um, this one's less known. Um, this one is known. This one has been calculated, but gallium antimonide has never been, or gallium bismuthide has never been synthesized. Um, you know, so, so basically what we're doing is we're, we're looking at all these different energies and we're tuning these energies, right? So, like I said, some of them are known. This one, let's call that known. This one has been calculated. This one has been known. You know, so we can, we can kind of um, start parameterizing. And the way that we normally do this is we, um, we know we have the experiments that we can compare to. So remember, I had the composition as a function of bismuth flux. And I know what the behavior is supposed to be as a function of increasing gallium flux, right? right? And so this is experimental data, and uh, we can fit to it, right. OK? And this is, this is largely related, essentially, to the growth of the droplets. But I guess I'm, I'm kind of targeting the This is not. This is not related to the growth of the droplets at all. In fact, this has nothing to do with the growth of the droplets. This has to do with the incorporation of the bismuth into the film. OK, so this is even before. Oh, okay. Fine. That, yeah. that, that point, okay, I understand but just that part of the problem. But you also say based on the something analogous to, to classical nucleation theory, there will be a certain critical size That's at right. which these droplets will will you know become stable. That's and right. So so that determines is determined by the nucleation energy. So that's what I am I'm kind of getting at. Right. And so so that the answer to that question is embedded in this phase diagram. And your question is great, and it is something that we've considered, but we haven't 
solved the problem yet. But it, it's essentially related here, right? Because we have, we know that at this flux, we've got um, no droplets. Above that flux, we do have droplets. Right. And you know, we know what those dependencies are as a function of temperature. And so we can do the experiments to actually pull those out. Okay. Um, and we just haven't okay. done that yet. Have, if you don't have an idea yet as to sort of what size that flux corresponds to, or what size is that? No, we do. This is in monolayers per second, right? Oh, so okay. this is 0.02 monolayers per second. Um, these, these are 0.5 monolayers per second. So we're looking at an order of magnitude difference here. So if these are 0.5, you want this to be a factor of 10 or 20 lower, right? And then that this is where the nucleation actually happens. So we can pull, we can write down nucleation, we can write down the, the equations and, and map them on top of this phase diagram to get what you're talking about. And we've done it for the droplet epitaxy work. Okay, so we've done it for that one. We just haven't done it for this one yet. Okay. So it is possible, and, and again, I encourage you to take a look at the same paper I pointed um, this fine young gentleman here, um, because the details are in there. But the method in doing that is, is going that, to be the that, same. That's, right. yeah, it, uh, that's what exactly what I was getting at, correlation of that incorporation versus the actual you know, nucleation. Of you're, you're exactly right. And it, it is possible, and we did it for, the, for that other paper, and we just haven't gotten there yet. But this is the kind of data that we need to compare to, OK? Any, uh, any other questions? If not, I ask you to, thank, to join me in thanking Joanna for a beautifully illustrated and very well articulated. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>